Hello, Donna Lewis again with the Clark County Park District, and today I'm starting a new series called Once Upon a Time in History. And today we're going to talk about the Indian Village. So with us today is Justin Houston, a living historian, and he's going to take us on a tour through the Indian Village. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Ozio, hello. Welcome to George Rogers Clark Park. Here at George Rogers Clark Park in Springfield, Ohio, we've decided to replicate an Eastern Woodland Village. Now, we're trying to represent the time when Tecumseh was going around to all the different nations of the Eastern Woodlands, and he was bringing them together in Prophetstown in Indiana. Now, it was near impossible in our modern time to be able to bring a representation of each one of those Eastern Woodland nations here. So what we decided to do here at the park was to utilize the natural resources of the park to create a hodgepodge Eastern Woodland village. We weren't able to get each person, individual person, so we decided to replicate the dwellings of each one of those nations that Tecumseh visited. Now also here at George Rogers, we do have an original Shawnee village that was here. In the late 1790s, uh, George Rogers Clark and a host of Kentuckians crossed the river and laid siege to that village. So we know that there was a Shawnee village here for a long, long time. But we're not representing the Shawnee directly. We're representing the people that Tecumseh visited. All right, if you'd like to come on through, you can see the open gate here of the village. This represents the open arms of the people welcome you to come into our home and be a member of the tribe. This is a stockade, and if you'll walk with me over here, you will see here at George Rogers, we've decided to utilize the natural phenomenon that we have here. We have the emerald ash boring beetle which is devastating the forest here. And so we have an abundance of ash wood and material laying around. So what you will see with each one of these things, the stockade included, are the vertical uprights. These posts that are forming the uprights are all from the dead ash trees. So we're making wise use of a bad situation and making something nice so we can all honor and respect the morning basically for these ash trees now also what we've done is we have another problem here in the park we have an invasive species called honeysuckle I'm sure a lot of you know what I'm talking about so we have a lot of it here and we spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to remove the honeysuckle all great and dandy but what do you do with all of these mountains of brush that are laying around well, we've come up with a solution here, at least a partial solution. Every bit of the weaving that you see on the vertically erected ash poles is all honeysuckle. So we're constantly pulling honeysuckle and we're constantly repairing the fence. Now, a lot of people say, well, they, why did they have a fence? And, and, and uh, to look at it, anyone could get through this. And what it did was it made a first alert system. Uh, in the time of the late 1700s that we're representing here and even going further back, they had buffalo herds, okay? They had bears. They had people who wanted to do harm. And there was no one communicating with them. So there had to be a system in place to give you at least a few moments notice that something was happening. And in the case of a buffalo herd coming through, a stampede, you're going to hear them smash through this fence. And therefore, it gives you a great idea, or at least a few minutes or a few seconds, of time to respond to an emergency situation. Now, so what we do is we just go right over to one of these honeysuckles. As you can see, most of our forest here is honeysuckle. So we're constantly dealing with it. So if you ever get a chance to be out here at the park, feel free to do this, but no honeysuckle versus native species. This is the Japanese honeysuckle, or some call it the Chinese honeysuckle. You can tell it has a very distinctive, and very soon it will be blooming. It smells wonderful, looks beautiful, but it is an invasive species. 
So what I like to do is I like to find a nice whip growing off there and just leverage that. And this is pretty much the same way this work would have been done even back in the old days. Now you come right on over to your fence where we've nicely got some vertical here. A tree fell and smashed this second section so we erected some more ash. We come in and we just simply weave that honeysuckle in between to create our woven stockade. Now let's do one more just to get a good idea. Find a good piece of honeysuckle I can reach. And we break it right off, works out real nice, no tools required. You can come right on out and do this yourself anytime. Just go opposite of what you did last time, just like doing a big oversized basket. You come in there and you weave that in, and it doesn't have to be perfect because soon we'll be doing it again. Okay, so you see that the stockade continues all the way around. Well, we're starting a three sisters garden. Um, it's a little early in the year yet, so we don't have any seeds in the ground. But what we're going to have here is a representation of the agricultural society that the Shawandasi or the Shawnee would have had at this time. Uh, they specialize in a very specific type of agriculture. Uh, it's world famous, worldwide. It's called the three sisters planning method. Matter of fact, we still use the same method to this very day. The three sisters, can you name them? Corn, beans, and squash. These are the three sacred sisters that are the life givers. Now these sisters are very special. You have corn, Selu, it's a Selu, the lady of the corn. Uh, she is the diva. She is the queen of all the sisters. She takes a lot of care. Uh, she takes a lot of work but she produces beautiful food that's so sweet and so enjoyable. Then there's the other sister, the Bean sister. Bean is a helper. She helps Selu, or the diva sister, Corn. She helps her by giving, as we found out in our modern time, that if you plant beans with your corn, the beans literally give off nitrogen, which is just wonderful for making things green. So she is a helper sister, and she helps the corn to grow nice and green and tall. And then the sister corn helps her because she can climb up, and she uses it as a trail, a corn as a trellis to grow up towards the sun. So they work together. Finally, you have the warrior sister, squash. Now this includes a lot of things, pumpkins, uh, cucumbers, uh, squash gourds. These are all in the native eye of squash. And a squash's job is if you ever look at a squash, it has these thorns all over it. And what that does is, is that acts as a fence and it's like armor, it's like spiked armor that she wears. And you plant her around the corn and the beans and it creates a fence. You'll literally see the leaves come up like a picket fence and you can shape that to grow around the beans and the corn and that will give you wonderful squash but it also serves as a great protection against little critters like raccoons, uh, rabbits, uh, squirrels, all these sorts of things. They don't like the spikes, the spikes that just drives them nuts. So try the three sisters planting method and see if you don't have some really good success. It's what fueled the entire Eastern Woodland Nation's big time agricultural society. So you're seeing some of my beautiful apple trees that I planted here in front of the longhouse at Kispoko Town. And here we have a lot of documentation for 1795 when George Rogers Clark and his men came across the river and besieged the village here. And it says that they spent several days burning the apple orchards. So what we've decided to do is come in and start bringing some of those to represent that yes indeed the Shawnee here, uh, the Piqua and the Kispoko clans of the Shawnee were indeed orchards. They had orchards there. It says that George Roger actually recorded spending some time uh, burning the orchards down. 
so you would have had orchards here. So that's kind of the reason why we have the apple trees here to represent that. It's a part of agriculture, a permaculture that a lot of people don't realize that the American Indian people were doing. But yes, indeed, they very much had these, these orchards. Uh, here I'm standing in front of our Iroquois version longhouse. Again, this is not representing the Shawnee people that would have been here. This is representing one of the tribes that Tukumthe or Tecumseh visited. And the Iroquois were a very powerful nation that he tried to recruit into his confederacy many times. And so what we decided to do was represent the Iroquois longhouse. Now we break some few traditions in building this because of our special circumstances here at George Rogers Clark Park. Again, the emerald ash borer has just devastated the forest. But one of the wonderful benefits is, is they eat this Cambrian layer out of the ash tree. And what that does is it almost like continually gives us a spring-like condition where in the spring you would go to slip the bark off the trees because the sap's running. Well, that's because that Cambrian layer's loosened up in the spring and it's easy to get off. Well, in this situation, the beetle has eaten the Cambrian layer. So now they're slipping off all the time. So it breaks the tradition of the regular American elm bark, which is what these houses would have been typically covered with. And we use, utilize the natural materials that we have at hand, the ash bark. So this is completely covered with ash bark from dead, fallen trees here at George Rogers Clark Park. Now, if you'd like to come on in, I can show you what the interior is like. Welcome to the uh, Iroquois Longhouse here at George Rogers. This is the interior. Uh, we looked up and we found that uh, many of the Iroquois nations, they would have longhouses that would be up to 100 yards long by 50 yards wide and would have multiple families living in one longhouse. Each family would have had a fire pit very similar to this one with a smoke hole in the top of the roof for each family group. You might have up to 20 different families living in one longhouse, so therefore 20 different smoke holes. Uh, in this house, we just pretty much have a, a simple uh, rock ring around here, and that works really nice at night because you get a nice fire going, and, and it heats those rocks up, and you get that thermal mass effect, and it's really nice. We have uh, cattail mats that we've hand woven here for several demonstrations, and we can unroll those and cover the doors up. Uh, many doors are covered with hides, uh, and the further you get up north, which is the case with the Iroquois people, uh, snow. Oh my goodness, snow. So they would literally build breezeways or like mud rooms outside of the main doors so that you would have this like airlock type situation where it wouldn't open it up and all your family get froze to death because it can have severe winters. Uh, again, each each family would have had their own fire. This house is about 20 yards long, or yeah, about 20 foot long by about 16 feet wide. So it's about a one family house, and it's just a good representation of what the Iroquois would have done. Again, everything is framed up and done with the emerald from the uh, ash tree, the ash wood from the trees here in the park. Uh, and then the bark is also from the ash as well. Uh, we have many things hanging up. You would have seen tobacco hanging. Um, all of this framing up here, you would have had multitudes of hides. Uh, the Iroquois power was derived from their deer skins and their trade with Europeans. So you would have seen a lot of hides smoking. You would have seen food stores, a lot of corn, beans, and squash up there in the racks drying. Uh, lots of different medicine plants and things of that nature would have been stored up above. Uh, the Iroquois would have certain clans uh, that would uh, be in charge of different parts or positions in the longhouse. Uh, certain clans would be to the door to the east. Certain clan would have a door to the north, a uh, door to the west and the south. All of these doors would have a certain clan that was in charge of taking care of that area. There were clans that were job were to take care of the fires and make sure those things were going. Uh, you would have seen carved clan posts with uh, different carvings of the different clans 
inside as well. But this is our representation of the Iroquois Longhouse. Thank you for joining us today for a walk in the Indian Village. Join us again soon for another program in the series called Once Upon a Time in History. Stay tuned on Facebook for updates to see what's coming up next. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.